My name's Tim Harper. I'm head of the School of the Humanities and Social Sciences here in Cambridge. And it's my very great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, you to uh, a conversation uh, event uh, marking India at 75, sponsored by the school and hosted here at Corpus Christi College. India at 75 is one of which I hope will be a number of occasions where we take time, take the opportunity to reflect on India's past, uh, present uh, and future. And with this in mind, it's my very great honour to welcome our distinguished guest, Mr Rahul Gandhi. Mr Gandhi, of course, is a leading parliamentarian uh, of India. He's the elected representative of Wayanad in Kerala since 2019, a national leader of the Congress Party since 2004, and a central voice in current debates on the state of India's democracy, on economic development and social justice, and India's place uh, in the world. In conversation with him this evening is Dr. Shruti Kapila, uh, a university associate professor in Indian uh, history and author of Violent Fraternity, India's political thought in the global age, which speaks very directly to some of these themes. It will be no surprise to anybody that tickets for this uh, event uh, 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 went in, in record uh, time. I'm delighted to welcome you all and delighted uh, that Mr. Gandhi took time out from his really busy schedule to spend some time with us today. And without further ado, I give the floor to Dr. Kapila. Thank you. Thank well, you. Well, um, thank you, Tim, and a very warm welcome. It's a total pleasure and joy uh, to welcome uh, Mr. Rahul Gandhi uh, to Cambridge, uh, to, to his own old home, uh, but also my home at, uh, here, uh, away from home in India. And it's uh, particularly nice that he chose uh, London and Cambridge to kind of break uh, the sort of fasting that has gone in mobility uh, during COVID. So it's, it's great that you're here. And I'm not going to sort of give a longer introduction because everyone knows who he is. And it's, uh, it's a real honor to get the chance to speak with you on some of the most pressing issues, not just facing India, uh, because India is certainly facing a turning point in its identity. Uh, but also globally, I think this is a, a moment of identity crisis, not just mere crisis because of Ukraine, because of China, and of course, post-COVID. So let me actually say that, you know, if we look at 75, 1947 uh, is a landmark event, of course, in world history, uh, not because India is, of course, the first country to be decolonized uh, from the empire uh, since America. So that in itself is a landmark event, uh, but also, uh, the time was, you know, if you look at Nehru, uh, the old alarm here, the great uh, Nehru who kind of is, uh, you know, synonymous with modern India, the idea of freedom and optimism really captivated Indians despite, uh, as it were, the legacy of partition, the violent legacy of partition. I think 75 years down the road, uh, I think India looks quite different. Uh, I don't mean simply in terms of optimism or pessimism. Uh, freedom certainly seems uh, to be in short supply uh, in an everyday sense in India. Uh, but also, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's not really a, a secret uh, that, in a way, India seems to be preparing for a new identity to anoint a different kind of India, perhaps in the centenary year of the formation of the RSS in 2025, which is to say that since uh, the, the arrival of Prime Minister Modi, certainly in the second uh, mandate, uh, we've seen an aggressive recasting of India's legal and cultural institutions uh, to redefine its compact, not just with its own citizens, uh, but also in the world at large, its own identity in foreign policy terms. So let me, you know, we'll, let's break all of this down, but first ask you what, how you would describe the state of play in India at the moment. Why don't you come move ahead? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, this yeah. is that. You have to move the chair closer, I'm afraid. Thank you. So if you look at the Constitution, 
and I said this in a speech in Parliament some time back, India is not described as a nation. It's described as a union of states. The exact, exact line is India, that is Bharat, is a union of states. And the implication of that is that there is a ongoing negotiation between this union of states, right? So in the Congress party, we, we view India as a negotiation between its people. Mm -hmm. The RSS views India as a geographical entity. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the big difference. So for us, India comes alive when India speaks. And India dies when India goes silent. Okay? And what I see is going on is a systematic attack on the institutions that allow India to speak. Right? Um, parliament, the election system, the democratic system, the basic structure of democracy is being captured by one organization. And as the conversation is being stamped out, the deep state is entering those spaces and redefining the way that conversation is held. And you can see, you can see the impact of this in different parts of the country. Uh, you can see this in the type of policies that are being implemented as well. So for example, if you look at the way GST was implemented, uh, instead of having a detailed negotiation with the states. So that's a national taxation program. Right, the GST yeah. is the tax. Instead yeah, of having a uh, long conversation, detailed conversation with the states, it's just decided that on so-and-so date at midnight, we're going to do GST, right? So it is, what I see as the big problem is the stamping out of the voice of a billion plus people. And that, I am absolutely convinced, is going to have repercussions. OK, so I'm considered to be a tough supervisor, so I'm not going to let you go off so easily on that one. Because some people would say that actually uh, Modi is very popular. This has a huge amount of social mandate in India. Uh, and that the victory of Modi you know, in several regional elections, OK, some setbacks here or there, uh, that actually this is popularly mandated, that perhaps Indians have changed not so much the idea of India. A democratic contest hmm. depends on certain structures. It depends on a election system that is free. Mm -hmm. It depends on a judiciary mm -hmm. that is completely independent. Mm -hmm. It depends on a press that is fair. And very importantly, it depends on the type of money that different political formations have. Mm -hmm. Right? So if we are fighting an electoral contest, mm -hmm. and we are fighting the institutional structure of India, mm -hmm. right? we, have taken, uh, we have taken things to the election commission, mm -hmm. uh, and we get no response. Mm -hmm. right? there are, there are, uh, you can see the press in India. I mean, the press, if you look at the television in India, there's one gentleman who's on it all the time, nobody else. Mm -hmm. right? So, <laughs> I mean, we know. Oh, yes. <laughs> that's, you know, you see one gentleman there, and, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he's the only gentleman who occupies that space. Mm -hmm. Now, in a, in a sort of 21st century environment, mm -hmm. uh, where your means of communication is media, where your means of communication is uh, social media, mm -hmm. and they have total dominance over those, uh, of course, it will affect the mandate. Mm -hmm. So you think that, in a way, the story of Hindu nationalism, how would you kind of want to assess the ascendancy of the idea of Hindu nationalism in relation to, say, Nehruvian India, or what Congress stood for, which was a multi-religious social compact? Uh, so don't you see that contest is much more about uh, this is not unique to India. You're seeing such exclusive forms of neo-nationalisms across the world. Um, so how would you kind of, you know, how would you want to sort of make a plea now for, as I said, you know, for the older idea of India? Is it sort of worn out? Does it need to? I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not going to make a plea for it. No. Uh, that idea 
exists in India. Okay. And that idea is going to fight back. Now, mm -hmm. the question is, how is it going to fight back? That's right. right? Um, you, can't, you can't impose a one ideology mm -hmm. on a place that is as complicated mm -hmm. as India. Mm -hmm. And you can see it. Mm -hmm. So as, I mean, as they push this sort of centralizing ideology, mm -hmm. you can see the result in states like Tamil Nadu, mm -hmm. you can see the results in states like Punjab, you can see the results in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. right? So you are, you are putting pressure mm -hmm. on the union on the conversation. And it's going to react. If you think that it's not going to react, well, you're in for a surprise. So then to speak, put this on the kind of democratic map or the political map of India, do you think that this poses a particular challenge to the Indian National Congress? Because one of the things that struck me, because I teach a course in Indian democracy here, it struck me is that India is unique from other mass democracies, say like America or Britain, which have always had a two-party system, right? You had the Tories and you have you know, the Labour Party. And in India, you've always had one national party and lots of regional parties. And that was the story for the Congress. And now do you think it's a change of hands that, or something else is going on? That's, I think, the uh, wrong characterization, okay. if I might say so. No. Go ahead. Because if you look at, <laughs> if you look at, again, view India as a union of states. Mm -hmm. Now tell me which state has more than two parties. Tamil Nadu has two parties. Mm -hmm. UP has broadly two parties. So uh, Madhya Pradesh has two parties. Rajasthan has two parties. No, I meant it at the national level. No. In our system, mm -hmm. you, if you're going to compare a, a, a United Kingdom, mm -hmm. right? think of India much more like Europe than you think. Mm -hmm. uh, That's right. Than, than like England. Mm -hmm. right? In, mm -hmm. India is much closer to Europe than it is to England. Mm -hmm. How many languages are spoken in England? Don't shame the English now. Right? Don't shame the English. <laughs> you know, it's just, a, you know, One? we grew up with three. They grew okay, up with half, two. you know. <laughs> so. so, so no, but we, we have to get this right. Because if we're going to understand it properly, we have to get it right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's much more accurate to think of India like Europe and think of a Europe that is politically and economically united. Mm -hmm. That's what India achieved Agreed. 70 years ago. Agreed. Right? Which, by the way, Europe hasn't achieved yet. No, it's a federation and broken again. Right. And, and it's under pressure. So what was achieved 70 years ago was quite a powerful, unique thing. Absolutely. Right? Uh, but it requires conversation between these states. Mm -hmm. Now, where does the where does the question of the Congress party and the BJP come in? Mm. The, the national party, mm. right, is the party that stitches up the conversation. That's right. right? So actually, I don't see it as a, a real challenge for the Congress party. Mm -hmm. I see it as a huge opportunity for the Congress party if the Congress party reacts to it properly. Mm -hmm. Right? And all political formations mm -hmm. go through transitions, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if you look at the record of the Congress Party, everybody gets excited that, you know, we are now in, not in power for seven years. We've been in power for 70 years, mm -hmm. right? And we've played a significant role mm -hmm. in developing the country and in bringing India to where it is. Of course, uh, we need to reinvent ourselves. That's right. We need to rethink. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that, yeah. We need to rethink what our role is. We need to rethink how we interact with the people. So what would be the first thing you would think requires a rethink? The first thing that requires rethink is opening the doors of the Congress party uh, and bringing in millions and millions of uh, youngsters into the party. So a new, yeah. Right. That's the first the thing. Millennium. Okay. Uh, uh, no. Now, you're clapping, but this is not so easy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> This is not, I see, when, when I was your age, I was like, yeah, yeah that thing's easy to do. Yeah. But after a while, it's not so easy to do. It can be done, it takes time, but, but it's not so easy to do. The second thing is that there's an ideological fight going on That's in right. India, right? Mm -hmm. There are two visions. Mm -hmm. One vision that says 
essentially the BJP vision, RSS vision says the social order needs to be protected. Mm -hmm. Right? India should progress, but people shouldn't move up and down the social order. Mm -hmm. And what we are saying is that one man, one vote, mm -hmm. everyone should have equal opportunity, everyone should have equal access. This is a contest. Mm. No, I, I, I get that, and that takes me straight to the question of the economy, because, of course, the UPA government in particular, and just years preceding to that, uh, you know, was the high moment of India, both in the global stage, but also the liberalization of the Indian economy, the rise of big tech in India, and, of course, the most ambitious and largest welfare programs in the world, such as the Manrega, you know, the minimum uh, employment guarantee scheme. Now, the question really is um, that sort of model, you know, in the sense you had high growth, high private investment, high liberalization, high interaction with the global economy, but also high public spending in India. That, so, you know, with, on the UPA, uh, and the, you know, that seems to me, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you know, that, that that model doesn't seem to be a Modi's model uh, because he has very targeted welfare schemes. It's a whole. So in, in a way, the economic kind of basis, economic policies also that the UPA laid down, your government laid down, seem to be changing. So where do you see the kind of economic scenario at a time actually um, it coincides also with deglobalization. So UPA was part of the global moment of you know accelerated connectivity in, in the world, and now for the last ten years, twelve years after financial crisis, uh, you know there's a kind of slow deglobalization which is accelerated it seems after COVID, and men like Modi seem to have gained under under such conditions. So how would you? Do on that. The, on the sort of Hindutva side mm -hmm. and on the exclusion side, mm -hmm. Modi is different than the Congress. Of course. Right? But on the economic side, Modi is taking what was sort of our middle of the road uh, mm -hmm. balanced ideas mm -hmm. to an extreme. Right? Say more. Uh, we would we were trying to balance the rural and the urban, for example. Mm -hmm. We were trying to balance uh, big business and farmers and laborers. He's not really interested in that balance. His idea is, uh, I mean, I, I get the sense he thinks uh, he thinks of the Korea model, where you have large, big sort of chebol, mm -hmm. right? That monopolize, mm -hmm. and then. I think he, he, he thinks he can give a sort of payoff to large numbers of people and let these people concentrate power and wealth. Mm -hmm. right? In my view, that won't work in India. Why? You get a huge backlash. Mm -hmm. right? You will get a backlash that you will not know what's hit you. Mm -hmm. uh, the other point is that view these things as a continuum. Right? Don't view them as... UPA did something, and now Modi is doing something. They feed, they feed into each other. So mm -hmm. what do I mean by that? Mm -hmm. uh, we, did, we did Narega, mm -hmm. right? Uh, most people think Narega is a handout to poor people. No, I don't, but yeah. You know, but yeah, most, yeah if you yeah, ask most yeah. Indian people, what is this Narega? They'll say, well, you know, why are you giving, why are you making people uh, lazy? Why are you giving them, you know, money in their pocket, etc.? Mm -hmm. so actually... Narega was a labor market intervention, mm -hmm. right? And Narega created a massive reaction yes. in Indian farmers. It was a, it was a very powerful move, mm -hmm. but it created a particular reaction, mm -hmm. right? And then that reaction feeds in to what comes after. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is don't think that good policies carried out now won't later create a backlash that gets you something that doesn't look anything like what you were doing. Right? For example, Aadhaar. Uh -huh. We had a totally different vision for Aadhaar. So let me just say Aadhaar is you know, universal identification in right. India, which was brought in. Um, you know, you, yeah. Your government had thought about it, had, had piloted it, but it became a uh, standard procedure now in India. So we put, we put in Aadhaar, which is sort of a uh, unique identity. Yeah. Right? And in our wildest dreams, we didn't imagine what Aadhaar would be used for. Yes. Right? So, so 
that that sense has to be there. You have to you have to have a sense that something that you do right now looks very good can suddenly take another turn under another administration. So you mean it's more about surveillance rather than about today? Yeah. So oh, today, it, today. Yeah. Adhar, today yeah. Adhar has How would become, you describe it's become a weapon. Okay. It's become a political weapon. So that actually right. takes me to the question on, you know, on actually big tech. You know, this is Cambridge. This is the place where a lot of the tech happens for Britain. And, you know, of course, there was Cambridge Analytica, as you know, uh, from here on misinformation and in which actually Indian, several Indian elections were involved, as you know, uh, quite apart from Brexit and, and what happened on the international uh, stage. Uh, so. Um, you mentioned monopolies also as well, so the two related questions, or you might want to take them separately. Uh, but it's sort of, you know, even Biden is facing the question of monopolies, particularly around big tech, and it's going to be a big story about his presidency, whether that's going to be regulated or not. Uh, and uh, so I'm just, so there's the problem of kind of uh, information around elections, uh, you know, campaigning. Uh, around, say, Facebook uh, and, and WhatsApp and other big tech. And then there's a related question of monopolies, which in India is not a tech monopoly. In America, it's a tech monopoly that they need to be broken. How do you sort of see the new architecture of this kind of digital economy? Why do you say it's not a tech monopoly in India? No, I mean, there's other ones too, like Adani. Right. I mean, you know, it's a multiple. It's not simply tech monopolies. It's, it's a kind of, you know, you know, as you know, that from airports to you know, you were yeah. saying the other day, you know, that so, so I'm, what I'm trying to say is that it seems to me that the world of deglobalization is r r leading to the rise of monopolies, both in America and India, for instance. Uh, and in India, it's kind of a couple of places, but in, in America, it's much more about tech, as you know, and, and these are also related to politics, because how are we now going to conduct elections? Well, you know? I'll tell you my personal experience. I don't believe that... Uh, the large social media companies mm -hmm. are neutral. Mm -hmm. I just don't believe that. Mm -hmm. right? uh, at least my experience in Indian politics, mm -hmm. uh, and I can, give you, I can give you examples, I'll give you one personal example, mm -hmm. where uh, on my Twitter account, mm -hmm. I was getting 40,000 new users a day. Mm -hmm. right? And then I went to a a girl was raped in Delhi, mm -hmm. a little know, yes. a Dalit mm -hmm. girl, and I went there and I did a protest. Mm -hmm. And magically, my Twitter users went to zero. Mm -hmm. They went from 40,000 a day to zero. Mm -hmm. right? And we wrote to Twitter and said, what's going on? Mm -hmm. like, Please explain this to us. Mm -hmm. No answer. They said, we don't have the data. We don't understand this. We are checking. Three months later, we decided to get in touch with the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. And we told the Wall Street Journal this. And a day before the Wall Street Journal article was coming out, it went back to 40,000. Yeah, that's interesting. That's my experience. Right? Yeah. Now, it's the same, it's the same with WhatsApp. I, I don't believe that these are neutral uh, platforms. Yeah. Right? So what is the, to be the, done the, about that? For example, the head of Facebook has never, never met an Indian opposition leader. Yes. Uh, right? He comes, he meets the prime minister, goes home. A... a, a I think the CEO of, the, of Facebook was a BJP person. In, in Delhi, yes. In Delhi. Yeah, that's right, so why are we imagining that this thing is, is a neutral entity? It's not. No, no, I'm not, I, I, I I'm not saying no, that. So, I'm not, I'm then, not yeah. saying that to you. Mm -hmm. But so, so the tech monopoly, mm -hmm. if, you look at, if you look at the way Indian elections are being fought, mm -hmm. they're essentially being fought on these platforms. Yeah, that's right. They're being right. fought on WhatsApp, they're being fought not so much on Twitter, but on WhatsApp, on Facebook, yeah. uh, on TikTok. Google. But oh, TikTok's gone. Gone, yes, I know. <laughs> they were very important the last No, time. but this is very important. Yeah. But this is yeah. very important, right? Oh, yeah. TikTok's gone. Yes, Why Jackie. is TikTok gone? Right? So, the first level of monopoly mm -hmm. is the media monopoly. Mm -hmm. I think uh, what someone said, 140, 160 uh, media entities owned by one person. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have a media monopoly, mm -hmm. and then you have multiple monopolies, uh, business monopolies right. that provide finance to the BJP. Mm -hmm. right. So that's uh, that's what we're facing. So how would you maneuver this? This is, this is so kind of hegemonic and so 
all encompassing the, the, in this description. The then. only way to face it is by going directly to the people, which is what the Congress Party did uh, before independence. That's the only way to face this. So back to Gandhi. Back to Gandhi. Social movement, protest movement, massive. Yeah, and there's a lot, the, lot of appetite for that. There's a lot of atmosphere for that. Mm -hmm. And the Congress Party uh, needs to redesign itself to absorb that energy and use that energy to create a new vision for the country. Well, that's the OK, so um, I'm going to uh, move you on a little bit and move you to the international scene, because a lot of people were uh, sort of, you know, we talked a little bit about America, a little bit about uh, tech companies, but we haven't really said anything about China. And China really is this big story for India. and. Uh, and I think that hasn't really been appreciated in the international press at all. Uh, I mean, I've been on several panels, and people are kind of always asking me fundamental questions as to why, um, why, for instance, India takes positions that it does currently. But we'll talk about Ukraine in a second. But there isn't an enough appreciation of the Indo-Chinese issue at the moment. Uh, so tell me what you think about China as a rising global power and in relation to particularly its neighborhood and India? So I think uh, there are two competing visions now on the planet, mm -hmm. right? Uh, one is the Western, India's a part of it, which is a maritime vision. Mm -hmm. And the other is a terrestrial vision, the Belt and Road. And a, a terrestrial planet mm. where most of trade moves from China through the old Silk Road to Europe mm. and China dominates that trade. Right. Those, that's, the, that's the clash. And that's what China is building. Mm. And what China is offering to the countries around it uh, is the idea of prosperity. Mm. So China is saying, allow us to build your infrastructure allow us to put in the, the communications backbone, allow us to put in 5G, allow us to put in all that stuff. Mm -hmm. We'll give you the money, you build your infrastructure, and then we will have prosperity together. Mm -hmm. That's what they're offering. And? Right? And it's a very powerful thing to offer, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not in our interest. You know, it's not in India's interest that China uh, expands out like this. Why? Because we are on the way to Europe, or uh, just because we are physically there, or is it a rivalry, a civilizational ri rivalry? I don't see it as a civilization ri rivalry, but it'll have severe consequences for India. It'll have serious consequences for India in terms of Chinese expansionism. So, why do you think the international world is not fully aware? The story is always told in terms of America and China. And which is why people because, have a because that's because that's really uh, those are the two poles, right? So America America defends and uh, defends one vision, mm -hmm. and China is placing another vision on the table. Mm -hmm. Now, where I have a problem mm -hmm. is when the West speaks about China mm -hmm. and when the United States speaks about China, mm -hmm. they always talk about stopping China's rise. So they have a sense that you have to stop this thing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But my question is, what alternative are you giving? Mm -hmm. right? if, if China's promising prosperity, mm -hmm. uh, you can't say to India mm -hmm. that, look, we will have a defense pact, mm -hmm. and we will fight with China mm -hmm. without the prosperity part of it. Mm -hmm. And so to, the Indian trade has to continue. Well, mean? so to me, the real question mm -hmm. is if there is an alternative vision, mm -hmm. that vision needs to actually create prosperity. It needs to create wealth, mm -hmm. right? But Sri Lanka and, and the Chinese story hasn't really worked out? Or would yeah. you say it is? Of course. I mean, of course, the, the, the Sri Lanka has gone very wrong. Mm -hmm. The Chinese have put in a huge amount of money. Mm -hmm. Huge amount of that money is being stolen. Mm -hmm. uh, and it didn't pan out. Mm -hmm. But the idea the Chinese are proposing mm -hmm. is prosperity. China, they've given $100 billion to Pakistan. Yeah, right? that's right. Yeah. And so, so they have a very clear vision about what they're trying to do. And 
it's a powerful it's a powerful idea it's not uh, it doesn't have it's not that it doesn't have a basis mm -hmm. but from our perspective i think we need to have an idea that provides pros prosperity of course there is a there is a defense angle to it mm -hmm. but there has to be an economic angle to it right and currently i don't see the economic angle to it so in in you know our relationship with the united states yeah, for example yeah uh, is hugely about defense. That's right. Yeah. It's, it's moving that way. Clearly. More and more. More but and more. I mean, when we talk to the Americans and the Americans talk to us, we talk about defense. Yeah. We don't talk about, okay, how do we jointly create prosperity and create a democratic model mm -hmm. that can make people rich. And does that worry you? Worry me, yeah. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. So on to on to Ukraine, and that, and then I'll come to a final question before I open it, which is that you know the whole story of Ukraine, when India kind of, as it were, refused to take a position, um, spooked certainly the international media and strategic cir circles here, uh, and uh, because it precisely for the reasons you have just mentioned that in the last ten to fifteen years, India has been seen to be going closer to the U.S. and then for not actually signing on to the UN, UN story, you know, the UN um, amendment, well, not amendment, the UN uh, move, uh, you know, it was seen, well, you know, what is India up to? Uh, and the word that was used in India was that, well, India doesn't really want this bipolarity. It's going to have a multipolar world. How do you read this? Is this a continuation of uh, Nehru's idea of non-alignment, which has been resurrected in certain kind of perverse ways again, or is it... Uh, no, I, I, mean, don't, I, yeah. I don't think the government believes in Nehru's idea of non-alignment, mm -hmm. but I think the government understood its constraints. Mm -hmm. And it understood clearly what the constraints were, and uh, I don't think they had much of a choice, myself. Right? But, but I, think a, uh, I think it's better to have a foreign policy that is strategically thought out. Mm -hmm instead of a foreign policy where you take one decision uh, with one event and then a suddenly another decision with another event, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I also don't think it's about uh, being, you know, uh, with America or against America. That's right. mm -hmm. I think uh, it's more nuanced than that. I think India is a big country mm -hmm. and India has uh, multiple relationships and India has to deal with the complexity of its own reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, you know, I'm going to ask a slightly semi-personal question and then I'm going to open the, the floor, which is because, you know, obviously 75 years, you know, we can take small bite sizes into the last opening decades and now more recent decades. But actually there's a middle period and we, you and I both belong to that middle period of that generation, which is that we are not midnight's children. We are born in the 70s. We don't have any of the optimism uh, that our parents' generation had. And we, of course, also grew up with a lot of collective violence around us. I in Punjab, but I was not alone. There were people in the Northeast, Kashmir. Uh, but also, uh, soon after that, you had the Hindu-Muslim story uh, flaring up with the Babri Masjid uh, mobilization and caste violence as well. So violence you know, has been a kind of big feature of people of our generation. And in your case, it's all too personal. So you know, we've just had a recent anniversary of your father's assassination this weekend. So my question really is about actually a kind of Gandhian question about uh, violence and how to live with it. And uh, in your case, it's also personal. And so could you sort of say a little bit on your own personal resilience on it, but also how you envision the compact between violence and nonviolence in Indian society? Uh. I think, I mean, the word that comes to mind is, is forgiveness, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, not, it's not precisely the, accu the most accurate. It's, you realize, mm -hmm. Well, I'm thinking, you realize, right? No, because you've, you've uh, 
I didn't mean to stump you, but it's, no, a, very obvi- it's a very no, obvious you, question. You haven't stumped me. But no one's stumped. asked you. I'm surprised. No, no, they've asked. They've have they? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> then why don't you have the answer? Because I'm, trying, I'm the trying to go deeper in the answer. Okay, let's do this. Uh, so, I think in life, you will always, especially if you're in in places where large energies are moving, mm-hmm. right? you will always get hurt. It's not, uh, if you do what I do, you will get hurt. It's not uh, a possibility, mm-hmm. it's a certainty. Mm-hmm. Right? Because it's like, it's like swimming uh, in an in a ocean with uh, big waves. Mm-hmm. Right? You are going to go under. It's not, it's not that you're not. Mm-hmm. Right? So then, when you go under, you learn how to react properly. Mm-hmm. So when you, when you, uh, so loss are, is productive. Loss. The forces. single, the single biggest learning experience of my life was my father's death. There is no bigger experience than that. Mm-hmm. Right now. I can look at it and say, uh, the person who, or the force that killed my father, Mm -hmm. uh, caused me tremendous pain. Sure, it's correct. As a son, I lost my father, and many of you would have. And that's very painful. But then I can't get away from the fact that that same event also made me learn things that I would have never, ever learned otherwise right Mm -hmm. so as long as you're ready to learn Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how nasty people are or how evil people are as long as you're ready to learn Mm -hmm. if I turn around and you know uh, Mr. Modi attacks me and I say oh my god he's so vicious he's attacking me Mm -hmm. uh, that's one way of looking at it and the other way of looking at it is say great I just learned something from him Mm -hmm. give me some more Mm -hmm. okay very Gandhian, uh, but now, yeah, with you, you, you. No, but you, you come to this right when you're when you're facing. Uh, when you're facing an attack, you come to this. There is no. There is no other realization possible. Right, it's like, you. it's like that. There's there's a poem. I I don't remember the name. Um, it's written by, I think I think it's a, Palestinian person right. who's been put in jail. Okay. I'll, I'll send it to you. Okay. And he's talking to the jailer. He's talking to the jailer. And the jailer, uh, he says to the jailer, look, from the, from the small window of my cell, mm-hmm. I can see your big cell. Right. Right. So everyone's in jail. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. 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 And, and you've got to be able to see that properly. Right. And if you see that properly, then you can figure out ways to deal with it or ways to get out. Thank you. Yeah, first of all.